you might have to do the slides for me. Yeah, yeah. I'll do mine and then I'll get up yours and then if then I'll do yours. Just have to okay. <laughs> okay. I've started recording. So I'll just launch in. <laughs> so this is briefing for you guys as DM Team West uh, on the Gambling Gay Neighbourhood Plan that was made in November 2022. Um, so just a brief introduction. It has the same weight and status in decision making as the adopted South Cam's local plan. Um, to meet the basic conditions necessary to make it through the neighbourhood plan making process, it has had regard to national policy and advice and it in general conformity with the strategic policies in the local plan. So therefore the two, when you read the local plan and MPPF and the neighbourhood plan, they should all be consistent. But should you find any areas of conflict between the policies in the neighbourhood plan and the local plan, the more recent plan takes precedence. So the neighbourhood plan takes precedence because it was the most recently uh, the neighbourhood plan has a set of, it has an aim, it has a vision and it has a series of objectives and from these the policies were created. So the aim of the um, neighbourhood plan is to ensure that the future development of the parish is carefully managed in terms of its scale and design. The vision flows on from that and the objectives flow on from that. And obviously these are all in the neighbourhood plan, so I'm not going to read them all out to you now, but just to give you uh, some context. I probably should have said, I'm Jenny from, <laughs> well, I probably should have introduced myself at the start. Um, I'm Jenny from the policy team, uh, so leading this briefing, and Kirsten Rayner from the parish council, the clerk will do a bit after me. <laughs> um, so, there's 10 policies in the neighbourhood plan. The first of those policies is one for any new homes and employment uses in the parish. And the policy is about um, ensuring a mix of housing sizes, particularly one and two bed houses, and seeking to incorporate renewable energy generation and water saving measures within new developments for housing or employment. There are then two site allocations in the plan, one for uh, residential development at West Road, which has already got permission but is allocated in the plan in case of any issues with that permission. Um, and equally, there's one for the reuse of the former first school buildings in Green End. Um, which it, which particularly supports educational and community issues. It's like that, so it's then a policy for local character, um, which is kind of referring back to the village design guide, and it's about protecting the gate and its satellite hamlets from kind of joining together and preserving that kind of uniqueness of the village in that respect. Um, there's a policy for employment sites. Um, so there's specific areas identified that this policy covers in relation to Station Road, Church Street, Green End. <coughs> specific policy. On this one, there's a the extra in paragraph 4.47 in relation to drove roads, the drove road sites, where it says it's a general rule extensions of up to 25% of the footprint of the existing buildings have the potential to be appropriate. So 
there's a bit more than what's in the policy on this one that so it would be helpful for you guys if you've got any permissions in applications or in pro world. So this is just the map that goes with those employment sites. So the red ones on the map are the sites that are covered by the policy and the pink <coughs> is showing another existing business area that did in an earlier version of the neighbourhood plan have a specific policy but through the examination process was taken out by the examiner. So it's on there to show you that this is a business, existing business use in that area, but it's coloured differently to be clear that it's not covered by the policy. Uh, there's then a policy for uh, supporting sports pitches. So there's two policies then relating to walking, cycling and horse riding routes. So proposals for the improvement of public rights of both walking, cycling and horse riding to encourage the use of non kind of car modes within the village and to kind of join up the existing routes. Um, there's a accompanying map that goes with it that kind of shows the routes and the possible um, routes. And I'll leave others to explain what might need to be secured through uh, the plan and application process to meet with that policy. Uh, then there's uh, the two final policies or for landscape and natural environment. So this is a kind of more general um, policy to enhance landscape, recreation and natural environment features. And then there's a specific policy that covers um, the area around Gambling Gate Wood. And although the policy doesn't have a specific wording within the policy itself in terms of what it means by the immediate vicinity, then there is a, a map in the neighbourhood plan, which is the little map on the right, that shows the kind of 200 metre cordon buffer around the area, which is referred to in the supporting text as to what the immediate vicinity is. Um, and so, yeah. That's just the map showing all the different landscape, recreation and natural environment features that are covered by um, 9 and 10. And then there is a policies map in the neighbourhood plan that has all of the different designations on it that obviously you need to look at alongside the local plan policies map and any other things. Um, we don't currently have neighbourhood plan designation is shown on the same map as a all the local plan designations. So that's me done. I just get uh questions present. what my screen is showing. Change which screen. I just think this did it for my mind. <laughs> I shot it. Well, 
this looks you want me to start talking and then obviously start talking and hopefully sure. it'll have at some point <laughs> okay good <laughs> Right, my name's Kirsten Rayner. I'm clerk at Gamma Gay Parish Council. Um, obviously, the main aim for me to come and talk to you today is for you to have, to have an understanding of the work that anyone will show in the last seven years to create this plan. And also just to identify some main issues um, that I think uh, is important for you to um, understand the context of where the policies have come from. Um, and I hope that will help you um, inform you're looking at planning applications in the future. Um, I think I've, there are some beautiful slides of Gamma and Gay. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly, but you'll just have to listen to each other for a bit. So, Gamma and Gay Parish Council, um, not only we respond to you on planning applications, but we're also the burial authority. We own and maintain open spaces. We're responsible for community buildings um, such as the old Methodist Chapel and we also own the Eco Hub, although that's a lease to a separate charity. Our process is to raise a precept every annum um, to um, service uh, the needs of the residents. Um, and we employ five part-time employees. Uh, there's a handyman, there's me and my job share colleague Leanne, and we also have a library manager. And my role is the parish clerk. Um, who am I? Um, I um, basically cover the planning aspects of the, um, at the Parish Council. I've got a degree in Urban Studies and a postgraduate diploma in Town and Regional Planning a very long time ago. My work experience um, um, comes from initially social housing development with a um, registered social landlord. Um, I then became, went over to the other side and joined um, South Bedfordshire District Council and became local government housing strategy manager. And I worked also for Sport England, developing green spaces programmes. Um, I worked for Gamma Gay Parish Council in a part-time capacity for the last 18 years, part-time with my colleague, Leanne Bacon. So I take the lead on planning matters and long-term planning issues, among other bits and pieces. I've been a member and secretary to the neighbourhood plan team um, between 2015 and 2022. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done that one. <laughs> We've got to move on. Um, so um, what is Gamma Gay? Um, it's that funny thing that sticks out on the far <laughs> left in green. So we're right on the edge, surrounded by obviously Huntingdonshire and um, central Bedfordshire and um, North Hertfordshire, I think, almost North Hertfordshire to the south. Um, so um, a bit of a strange anomaly on the side of South Cambridgeshire, but that's where we are. Um, we have about population about 4,000. <laughs> and um, as I as already discussed, described by Jenny, um, our vision was to continue to be a thriving and sustainable community, an attractive, friendly place to, to live and work. Um, we wanted to conserve the cons uh, distinctive character as Gamma Gay is a radial village, so we'll have a, a core urban centre with very small satellite um, collections of properties um, surrounding it at, at a certain distance. Um, and we wanted to also nurture growing local employment and community facilities to ensure quality of life for all residents. So we aren't a dormitory town. We very much have quite a large amount of local employment. Um, Gamma Gay traditionally has suffered um, due to its location and being isolated from main services and provisions. That's meant that the population haven't had perhaps access to um, higher education as much as perhaps living in other areas of South Cambridgeshire. Um, so um, there's quite a lot of um, white collar and blue collar jobs in Gamling Gay. So we wanted to try and preserve what we have there to make sure that um, the village still stays vibrant in the future. OK, so those were the main objectives. Um, there are six <laughs> objectives. Um, these came out of uh, consultations with the community over a period of time. Um, housing and housing growth. We wanted to meet the needs of the community by supporting new housing that's appropriate in size, affordable and adaptable. Um, 
want um, high environmental standards for these properties. And when we did our housing needs survey, there's a significant demand for one and two bedroom um, larger accommodation or smaller accommodation bungalows for people to move into when they retire. But what, what we're consistently getting is four and five bedroom detached executive dwellings, which no one can afford. And this is basically becoming more and more of a problem. Existing properties or small village um, cottages are being um, continually uh, extended to make them into four bedroom, five bedroom dwellings. And um, the local population is struggling to get on the housing market. So effectively, that's why you've got policy one, which states um, that we want one and two bedroom houses coming forward as part of um, new housing developments. Um, so we do have a large proportion of expensive houses and that local people can't actually afford. Um, we want small, affordable uh, to buy and heat and adaptable homes. So the second main part of um, the plan is about local character. This is supported um, wonderfully by the village design guide that was adopted in 2020 and it builds on that really. Um, so we wanted to in, um, maintain the integrity of Gammon Gay as a radial village with its satellite hamlets um, and protect the open countryside and its landscape setting. People in Gammon Gay are really pleased and the fact that they can access countryside very easily within um, two or three minutes of walking out their front door. Um, new buildings reflect and contribute to the strong character of the built heritage um, from the, it, it expressed in the village design guide. So people born here uh, love living in this rural area. They want the, um, the right kind of development in the right places, um, development in keeping with its surroundings. Um, and the right place for new homes is within the boundary of the village. So um, about, I mean, I've been monitoring applications in Gammon Gay, as I said, for the last 18 years. And I would say 80 percent, possibly 90 percent of all applications that are coming forward now are in, outside the village envelope. And that's consistent. So it's, it's a concern um, that we have about development in the countryside. OK, other objectives. Um, we really wanted to try and maintain and preserve our local economy and employment. As I said, um, quite a large, we haven't got any presentable bus service, so people are relying on um, car for travel um, and um, they access um, Bevishi services as much as they access Cambridge services. So um, we have an issue where we want to <coughs> keep our jobs in our local areas. So um, we want to keep those jobs close to residents. Um, and so we have um, issues are for um, training for young people and making them having access and to stay in education and training and those barriers. Obviously, if there's local jobs or local opportunities for them to gain work experience, that's all, all for them. So that's what we wanted to do from a local economy and employment perspective. We've also lost quite a large proportion of our employment land um, developed from employment land to housing. That's the Downing Gardens development. If you know that it's currently being built out, 90 dwellings um, we lost. I think we like five or six businesses had to leave the village um, due to that. So there are issues relating to trying to maintain the existing employment within the village centre and in close, close proximity. Um, the other thing is community amenities and facilities. Um, specifically, we were concerned in the, in the neighbourhood plan about preserving the open space adjacent to the old first school. The first school is now redundant um, and is empty um, owned by the county council. Um, we wanted to um, preserve the open space adjacent to that, um, but the developer removed that policy. So this the whole aspect of the of the vision and the objectives here was relating mainly to that and preserving other facilities in the community. Um, so if you see quite a lot of references to the first school field in our objectives, that's what it was relating to, but that policy was deleted by the inspector. Okay. Um, how we get about, um, this is the other main aspect to Gammon Gay Neighbourhood Plan. Um, we wanted to try and encourage people to walk and cycle more. Um, Gammon Gay 
um, if you talk to any cyclist, will say that it's the most dangerous place to cycle in the whole of Cambridgeshire. Um, it's very fast moving traffic, um, lots of parked cars on the side of the road. Um, um, it's um, uneven surfaces, lots of potholes, um, lots going on in this village centre and it's not a safe place really to cycle. Quite um, significant portions um, of um, in the village don't have footpaths. None of the hamlets around surrounding Gamagate have any footpaths um, or street lights. Um, so effectively, um, village centre um, has gaps in its footpath network as well. Um, so we wanted to make try and make it easier for people to walk and cycle to school, um, uh, access the main shops on Church Street. Um, so we produced a Gamagay um, footway and cycle improvement plan, which is an appendix to the um, neighbourhood plan, and that identifies um, a specific route um, from Gamagay Centre to Potton, um, which is to try and link up um, Gamagay to the nearest um, railway station, which is at Sandy. Um, Potton have their own plan to link from Potton to Sandy, so it was just trying to incorporate a link through um, to that station to allow better um, public access to um, um, transport. So, and the final area of objectives is the nat natural environment. Um, we have a SSSI Gammon Gay Wood, and we we're, were very um, concerned about um, actual encroachment of development on that SSSI. <laughs> and we're also wanting to preserve our existing green infrastructure and in try and encourage people to walk and cycle access to the open countryside. Um, so that was the main, if you like, the main objectives that came through from that work that we did with the um, residents. Just a quick question. Do you know you've seen a link between Gavin and Gay and Potton? Yes. And obviously the Potton train station is not functioning at the moment. Are there? Sandy. Sandy. You said there was a link between? From Potton to Sandy railway station. Not via the train? So Sandy is where the, the local yeah, train yeah, station. Sorry, what, what I thought I heard you said was they're planning on um, opening the link up between the train stations again. Is that not? Did I hear that incorrectly? No, that's something separate East West Rail. I can cover that later if you like. Well, that's right. I can say uh, Potton's train station is not even open. So no, there's no Potton. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, fair enough. Railway is at, at Sandy. Okay. So I meant the cycle link. Yeah, from I'm with you now. To Sandy. Okay, sorry if I wasn't clear. Um, yes, yeah, so the next page. So this, obviously, you've seen this already. This policies map. Um, the, the the arrows actually I'll bring to your attention. The purple arrows are the the views um, which need to be preserved. Um, it, it effectively, um, it has quite an important um, role with regards to um, keeping the separation between Yamagate yeah, Central and and the small hamlets that surround it. Um, I'll talk about the hamlets um, separately, but um, uh, views to Gammon Gay Wood, views across two countryside to the open spaces um, are particularly important. And um, if you'll notice the yellow areas, so that was almost like um, the land which um, is under pressure for development, um, which are the only fields effectively between that and the, um, and the hamlets. So it's just bringing that to your attention really. Okay. So we talked about the aims, I think, um, covered. So New Hampshire, we had a housing needs survey um, um, and we're currently building out 90 dwellings um, actually on um, Green End, as I said, down in gardens, which is providing obviously catering for a significant amount of our housing need. Um, we've also got in the plan itself, the West Road, which is yet to start on site in earnest, uh, which will probably st um, start being delivered in 2024. Um, so um, we don't feel there's a there's a um, graph in the neighbourhood plan that shows um, the calculations of what the housing need was and um, effectively how that's being provided for in the next five years. So we don't feel that there is any local housing need in the next five years. And, and there's a list of developments which are catering for that identified in the in the neighbourhood plan. Um, the only area that we do have a, a deficiency on is um, small um, bungalows. So the current supply, as I say, of local homes is identified. Um, within um, policies one and two. Um, 
um, self build and custom build. Um, so there was a uh, planning appeal on the land, land adjacent to the um, um, development framework, which was permitted um, for nine on Green End Heath Road, um, which is now on site. Um, we've also had significant numbers of um, self builds come forward um, when there was a lack of housing land supply in the period um, sort of 2017-18 through to 2020. So 15 residents um, ended up building their own um, in the open spaces outside the village framework, mainly in Little Heath and on Great Heath. Um, so um, I would say uh, from a self build and custom builds perspective, we probably better catered than most villages with regards to that. We've also got these nine that are actually starting on site now. Um, with regards to employment, obviously um, we wanted to support the expansion of existing businesses and try and keep them in the village. As I explained, the green end developments to housing lost five or six main employers from the village. So we didn't want um, repercussions or any further loss of uh, employment. So we wanted to support existing businesses on the Drove Road. I think Jenny showed you the the red blobs, so the two big red blobs to the north on the Drove Road basically are the existing industrial, one's a farm and one's a um, um, industrial um, unit of three or four businesses. Um, there's also Station Road um, industrial site um, and there's also, um, like I say, a small um, remainder of uh, the Green End and there's one site on Church Street. So um, we wanted to just, like I say, keep jobs for available for local people. So um, the strong emphasis in the neighbourhood plan is the character. So um, like I said, the gap between the central village core and the surrounding hamlets, if you look at the right hand pitch, oh no, actually, if you I'll find you a picture and I'll, I'll tell you where the V shape of the core of the village is. On the left hand side, um, this is the view from um, Greenacres estate across to um, Dennis Green, which is a small um, Hamlet and basically it's one fee field's worth width between the two. So this is um, what we call the Lupin field and, um, and there have been um, planning applications on that land in the past. So that is one of the yellow fields that's identified in the neighbourhood plan that um, it, it has the character of keeping the um, Hamlet and of Dennis Green and um, Greenacre separate. The other issues um, you'll see on the right hand side, that's the extent of um, the village um, core, if you like, and you'll just see on the left hand side of that picture, um, there's a um, social housing development, South Cam's houses of North North Road and uh, North um, Street and East Street, I think they're called. Um, and that's the beginning, if you like, of the sinks, which is a separate hamlet again. The um, <laughs> housing that, um, built by South Cam sits between those things, but basically is in open countryside. So again, you'll see that there's um, one or two fields effectively separating the sinks from Gamge Central in that picture. Um, so the, 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 the um, it's squeezed most, if you like, at Green Acres to, to um, Dennis Green. Um, but also it's starting to be squeezed between Little Heath itself, which has experienced um, significant development, as I explained, of executive housing. And also to a lesser extent at the far south of Mill Street and onto the um, Mill Hill, which is mixed development um, with industry. There, there is a gap, so there is a gap there between the village core, if you like, and separate hamlet. Uh, the other main um, element of the neighbourhood plan is to support non-motorised travel and provide new paths and cycleways and bridleways. Um, uh, our, we had a, um, a strategic environmental assessment done uh, of our proposals um, for supporting new business in Gambling Gay and the elements of that pro pro prove that a significant proportion of carbon emissions will from um, Cut travel by the um, private car, and obviously we have very limited op other alternatives in our location. So the purpose of the policy 
and the objective was to reduce um, non um, to reduce motorised travel by encouraging people out of out of their cars as much as possible and to walk around the central village core rather than getting their cars drive to school get back in their car and drive home. Um, so basically, make it safer for people to walk and cycle. And so we did some studies, and the brown areas are the the, the one the areas where we wanted to improve links. Um, within um, the parish, but obviously there are also more strategic links to link with um, neighbouring um, um, council areas um, and, and neighbouring villages, for example, Potton, um, Wesley, and also um, to Everton. So the brown um, roads there basically are the ones that we want to try and improve. OK, and the last element really is the protecting and enhancing the, the natural environment um just concerned for the number of applications that are coming forward and that are outside our village envelope and and um, wh um, what they are and there's quite a lot um, um of pressures so on the left you'll see as i said we've already seen this picture you're looking towards gambling wood in the far north and then on the right this is the one of the roads that takes you to little heath um, um it's very um um, a single track um, road um, open to traffic, um, but it is under pressure from um, uh, neighbourhood neighbouring uh, planning development. The West Road development potentially we could border this if there was an application um, to develop land adjacent to it. So this route in particular, I think, is is um, very important and is very characterful. So I think it's important to bring it to your attention. Um, so our valued local amenities um, we are concerned about what's going to happen on uh, the first school site. Um, as I said, this is the only area you can land a helicopter if there's an emergency in, in on the west side of the village to service um, the people in, on, in, in that area. Um, if it was to be developed, there would be nowhere for people to for people to get access to that emergency health care service. Um, the, the building you see is a, a fairly new extension um, to the first school. Um, so unfortunately, um, the develop, um, there is one policy in there about the reuse, and I understand that there will be some applications coming forward from the County Council to reuse the whole of the um, first school site in the new future. Um, but um, as I said, um, we want to improve paths and um, encourage non motorised travel within the parish. And we also need a new football pitch. So particularly on the west side of the village, we have a limited amount of play opportunities and sport facilities on the west side of the village. Everything's on the east side near to the eco hub. So our idea is, would be to try and en encourage and provide some kind of sports facility on the west side of the village. Um, um, within this plan and one of the policies specifically asks to provide a new football pitch. So the policies in summary, um, housing growth, housing that's appropriate size, affordable and adaptable, local character, protect landscape setting and the open side and the strong sense of character, local economy and employment, nurturing, grow local businesses, um, to protect value local amenities, including the first school and grounds, um, encourage um, people to get out and walk, network of footpaths to provide walking, cycling and riding for everyday journeys and recreation and to protect, protect and enhance the natural environment and biodiversity. Um, there's a quick flash through some pictures of Gallery A just to, to bring the idea of the character areas which um, are identified in the village design guide. Um, that we can quickly go through just to identify the main characters and try and get it in your mind where everything is. OK, we have um, Church Street, which is our main church, um, main village street where we have mainly our shop and our main pub, which is the Cock Inn. And we've also got um, the Wheat Sheaf pub and the church at the end, obviously, Church Street. And there's the co-op um, and a few other little, I think it's a fishing um, tackle shop in the middle. <laughs> this just opened up. So a few bits and bobs. And I see on the cross where you're where this picture's taken, there's also um 
um, another around the coals and there's a hairdressers and just to the left uh, down Sinks Road is our, where our post office is. So this is, if you like, the core centre of the village. Mill Street is the other main old street. So there's a um, garage um, forecourt there. Um, and it's a fairly narrow, narrow straight street, which is the B1040. It takes you from Biggleswade uh, through to um, A428. Can I just ask, in reference to Church Street? Yes. Because there's always cars parked down there. Is yes. that residents who live on that road parking there, or is it other people sort of coming in to use the co-op and? Most, as well? uh, most it's residents, but there are also quite a lot of people who, yes, travel by car to the shop, uh, expect to just park and get out, get back in and go. Yes. yes so there, there is an issue there. Um, we've tried to address it in the past not really there's not much more we can do about it unfortunately mm. other than improve cycle walking or if people not to use the car yes exactly so if we make it easier for people to walk and cycle we hope that they they, they choose that option so you'll see here that there's a main triangle um of the main central core area so there's the road from from potton that you see in in, in the in the foreground that goes straight up the hill that's mill street and then there's a triangle off that which is stocks lane and then obviously the top part of that is Church Street. So there's a triangle, which is the old historical core of the village. And then um, if you look at, then there's got housing estates um, dotted around the outside. So, sorry, in the previous slide, there's the, there was the, um, don't worry about it. <laughs> that's Chapel Fields. And then you see on the far right, that's Poppy Fields. And then obviously um, to the west side, we've got Green Acres, estate and then we've got a numerous numerous other states that are dotted off mill street and wesley road um so next sorry next one that's so that's an example that's poppy fields um which um very successful development obviously provided a finance to this for this beautiful park we had the land transfer from the um, from the landowner to create the park the money from um, with section 106 and also significant resources to um, help build the eco hub. <coughs> um, employment and business. So this is broken group on Mill Hill. Mill Hill is quite a large industrial, mixed industrial area, um, large businesses, business development. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the buildings um, on Mill Hill and the, and the types and uses. Um, we have also other employers, um, next slide, um, um, which are um, timber frame manufacturers. So Pinewood structures are based in Gamigate, Donaldson's also, um, and they basically are providing, obviously supporting the, uh, the housing, housing development industry. Um, large lorries, which obviously taking these products, leave and, and arrive in Gamigate quite regularly um, causing problems obviously on our narrow streets but roofing trusses modular housing sections obviously we're not too far away from kingspan also that um so next side hamlet so again this shows you on the right hand side you'll see that's little heath um and as you see it's completely separate from them in the main village um but um becoming increasingly um developed um, with executive um, single dwellings, um, also receiving quite a lot of applications for annex accommodation and Airbnb type um, ancillary accommodation in that area. Um, but you can see there also there's there's um, uh, an old historical Saxon walkway that comes off um, that main road that you can see to the left. Um, which takes you across is the Green Sand Ridge. Basically, it takes you all the way to Leighton Buzzard, um, and along there is Dennis Green, basically, which is this very small hamlet I mentioned to you, um, just opposite Green Acres. Um, and then you see in the far distance, obviously, Gamligay Wood, and the and the um, heathland, if you like, the sort of um, heathland to the left, which is the Grey Heath. Um, this is another picture of the Lupin Field, as we call it, and, and in the distance you can just see um, dead screen. Okay. So um, 
woodlands and heathlands. I think you've just seen the picture of the heathlands. Um, you can see from this picture, this is just looking across the recreation field from the eco hub towards the wind turbine. You'll see pot and wood in the distance. So Gamingay, if you like, is um, surrounded by ancient woodlands. And so this is pot and wood, um, which is just outside our parish boundary. Um, there's also white wood, um, which is to the left of this picture, right at the edge of the Great Heath, which is like an open expanse to the left, um, the left of Gamlingay. Okay, you can see the um, Gamlingay wood in the distance. Okay, um, we've just talked about um, character hedgerows previously. Um, this slide again. Um, all hedgerows are marked on one of our plans. Obviously, you have your own records as well relating to hedgerows, but it's a very important feature of Gamingay Parish, um, particularly even within um, um, the urban areas. Some existing um, ancient hedgerows still survive, um, and we'd like to maintain and keep those. And obviously, this, the character of this road to uh, Little Heath really needs to be um, protected. So just to talk about our current issues i've probably done it as i've gone through um so we have at the moment significant numbers of annexed applications in little heath and great heath in the open countryside we're just concerned that these are creating additional separate households or holiday let accommodation which increases pressure on our services and amenities um james can talk about whether or not section 106 contributions are aren't relevant um, obviously, it increases um, issues on access to play, doctors facilities and our footpaths and cycleways. Um, we haven't got any footpaths in the hamlets, hardly at all, um, and very limited street lighting. <coughs> if you like, our, one of our, our aims for this neighbourhood plan is to try and improve and provide uh, at least footpaths um, in some areas uh, for these for residents who live there. Um, so also, there's a lot of conversion of agricultural buildings to residential in the open countryside, particularly in Little Heath and Great Heath. Um, and James will talk about whether or not we're able to provide any additional contributions in that area, but I think not. I think was the answer, but I'll let him cover that. Um, so um, the other thing we have suffered from the past is a drip feed of new applications where um, we've had applications for two or three dwellings which have been approved and then another two or three and another two or three or another two and three. And I think down the bottom of West Road was a prime example of that where the developer got away without any Section 106 contributions for anything. And we have a development, I think, of 13 dwellings down there in the end um, where the parish gave absolutely nothing from it. So um, that is common, um, um, has happened previously and is likely to happen again on the new South Build site on the Green End. Um, all buildings and land, I've talked about that. Um, Station Road, so what happened was the um, lower school moved to our middle school when the middle school was closed and the middle school became um, Gammon Gay Primary, which is on Station Road. Um, that has been very successful and has expanded and is continuing to expand. Unfortunately, there was no re remediation measures put in the planning uh, application or the permission to improve footways and cycleways to the school. Um, previously, um, obviously, a lot of people, people bring their children because they're of a younger age to the primary in their cars rather than um, previously as the middle school that the children used to walk to school. Now, um, significant numbers come by car, and that's caused significant issues in the station road or the whole of the east side of the village um, at school, pick up and drop off times. And also, obviously, the new uses for the old redundant first school site and the potential impacts that might have on residents in the local area. Um, we have some applications converting premises on Church Street, Church Street to takeaway units. And there's just been some issues regarding resident amenity and issues relating to those. We do need a new football pitch, um, preferably on the west side of the village. So if there's any opportunities um, with pre-apps um, where um, there's a site in the west side of the village and there's opportunities to provide sporting facilities, um, uh, we'd appreciate it if that was um, mentioned at least. 
And um, Jenny, you obviously covered the issue of the Mill Hill anomaly, um, where we did have a policy, a specific policy relating to um, improving and, um, and creating more employment on Mill Hill, uh, which was removed by the inspector. Um, obviously, there are some large employers up on Mill Hill, but um, GAM4 doesn't actually, um, it's not relevant to them. Or, however, we would also obviously like to see um, um, electric charging, et cetera, et cetera, on the Mill Hill site, but it's not actually in the policy, unfortunately. So I hopefully that's covered, Gamma Gay, in a nutshell. Um, if you've got any other questions you want to ask me about it, um, I know James is going to cover the issue specifically related to GAM 8 and securing um, finance for um, improving footpaths and cycleways, which is a specific, um, um, a specific issue that's been identified in this neighbourhood plan. Um, and all the details of that are in Appendix 3 in the neighbourhood plan. Uh, if there's anything else anyone wants to ask me. Silence. <laughs> um, hello, is hello. it Kirsten? Kirsten? Yeah. Hello, Kirsten. Um, my name's Phil McIntosh, me uh, interim delivery manager for the West Team. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's quite useful to get a, a rundown on 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 gambling gay. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I just had a few questions, um, and uh, I suppose. I'll start with the housing site. Uh, you've got one housing allocation, um, which you've referred to, and I just wondered if there's been any discussions on that site with the parish as yet um, about what may come forward, uh, what your what your potential, I suppose, envisaging coming forward, because there's no there's no reference to quantum of development about what number of dwellings that site might take. Um, and also thinking about you, your policy talks about wanting one and two beds, but obviously it doesn't exclude the provision of other size dwellings, three, four, five, which I think you've, you've sort of say that village has got enough of, but your, your policy doesn't exclude that. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering really what the parish's view is of, of <coughs> what they see coming forward on that site. Okay, well, the planning commission is for 29 dwellings. It was, it was granted in 2017. Right. Um, the mix has been identified and they're about well, probably within four or five months of starting on site. There is okay. affordable housing as part of that scheme, which is identified, um, and it's all with local village criteria for all the affordable housing, social housing that's rented and shared ownership as part of the scheme. There's okay. a number of um, one and two bedroom accommodations within the site and some bungalows. Does that answer your oh. question? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's fine. I was, I hadn't appreciated it's already got a planning permission. I thought it was a, a new allocation um, for for a site to be to come forward. So, yeah, that's that's uh, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, oh, James is going to come on to this. Obviously, the, the tariffs <coughs> that you've that have been referred to uh, in the appendix uh, of the local plan. And you've talked about trying to encourage business uh, and employment in the village, but you're then also applying a, a, a tariff on uh, sustainable transport. Um, I just wondered if the parish has got views about whether they think that's actually going to discourage businesses wanting to be in the village. I I don't think so. Um, I they, we've had consultation with all the. Um, um, local businesses and that, that was run as part of the neighbourhood plan process and we didn't receive any objections from any of those businesses to the policies um, identified in the plan. So um, we did specifically do a business um, consultation as well as resident consultation as part of our process. Okay, I suppose that's, well yeah, I suppose that's existing businesses. Yeah, I'm just wondering yeah, around around obviously if if because it, it does relate to new business units, whether there's yeah, we need to see whether there's some uh, concerns around having to apply that to business units. But like you say, um, we'll have to see, wait and see what the outcome of of that is. Um, I suppose my only other point is around the infrastructure talking about 
and you're saying that the village wants a football pitch and footpaths and all that sort of stuff, but just wondering how you expect that that is really going to be delivered if there isn't the growth that would suggest that it's capable of being delivered through development as proposed in this neighbourhood plan. I suppose the plan is a period of 30 years in total, isn't it? And but the first five years, the housing need is, um, is, is satisfied, but that's not to say that obviously there will be new development coming forward in the future. Um, so I think that the, the door is open effectively. Also, residents are aware that the football club need a new football pitch. And obviously, local landowners may be um, willing to consider um, provision of a field in the proximity of the village. And obviously, if they do approach you for pre-app discussions, it's just very useful if you alert them to the fact that there, that is a require, well, a need in the village. Mm. It's just obviously communication at that early stage is really important. So that's why it's there as a part of the policy. OK, yeah, I, I don't know if Jenny knows whether there's been any um, sites put forward, I'm assuming there has been under the emerging local plan but, uh, and whether they've been looked at as yet uh, as part of that process. But I suppose that would maybe be early for that yet. Um, I don't know if Jenny wants to comment on that. Um, yeah, OK, that's that's great. No, thank you very much for that. It's, it's useful. And as you say, if we if we do have um, uh, landowners trying to promote land or bring sites forward. Certainly, I'm sure they will be wanting to speak to the parish about it, and we would certainly be encouraging them to do so. That's great. Sorry, I just had a question that sort of piggybacked off what Phil was saying. Maybe James is possibly going to help. Um, so I don't know, but I had sort of concerns around contributions towards the cycle and footway improvement plan between Potton and Sandy. Mm -hmm. Um, the sort of have, has that been costed up as part of the neighbourhood plan? And so there's a detail in Appendix Three of how that was that the numbers were actually uh, came about, and it's on the model advised by James and yeah. um, the county officer. And it's, um, so basically, it's a calculation, um, and then um, James will be able to explain a bit further. But any new development within Gamagay, um needs to um, apply that and yeah. I think James is going to talk well, I mean, to you about what that. I'm concerned with that is that obviously you're saying that the housing need is for the next five years is broadly satisfied but when developers do come along and we do secure contributions we only have a certain amount of time to collect that money and spend it before the developer can ask for it back. Are you confident that there's going to be enough development coming forward to cover the cost of the entire improvement works and deliver the number because you know the contributions that we can ask for need to be sort of proportionate and commensurate to the size of the development. And that's the detail that's in Appendix 3. So um, effectively, Amigo Parish Council have their own allocated reserves to try and improve footway and cycleways. And we also have the access to County Council to for the minor highways improvement schemes to develop um, portions of, and we have already delivered, I think, a 200 metre stretch to the farm shop um, this financial year, um, which I think has cost about um, £85,000. So the Parish Council is, is used to delivering and um, improvements to footways and cycleways within the parish, and it's something that we do. So it's not a problem. The money obviously gets passed to the parish council. We have five years in which to expend it, and obviously anything that's not expended will go back to the developer. So effectively, that that's the safety mechanism for them. If as long as you um, can deliver it in part as the money comes through, and not just have to wait until the whole sum is in. Yeah. Or yeah. delivering the project. Yeah. I mean, it, it it will carefully manage, and obviously we have to monitor all these policies as part of the neighbourhood plan. So I'm I'm looking to all of you to help me to do that because I'm not an expert in monitoring family gay neighbourhood plan policies. This is new for everybody. But what I can say is we do have a good track record of delivering projects and it's not something the parish council is going to shy away from. And the issue of linking with Potton um, is part of a, a larger scheme, but there's also small stretches of footpaths with, you know, 20 or 30 metre stretches that are missing within the the main framework of gambling gay that we can easily deliver and we think we're confident that we can do that. Thanks. Yes. 
think of the James wants to do yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> right um so a tiny bit of storytelling here if you bear with me for a second so south cams as you should all be aware is not a still charging authority so we are entirely dependent on developer contributions to mitigate the impact of development and secure money um, from the developer for the community. Um, also, you're probably aware that the written ministerial statement made by the government in 2014 introduced a threshold beneath which developer contributions shouldn't be secured towards um, kind of large scale projects of which many developments would kind of um, need or benefit from. Um, admirably, the parish council through, in a, through the neighbourhood plan um, attempted to address this um, issue by um, constructing a policy whereby um, for all new employment space, £21 per new square metre was paid into a pot by the developer through a section 106 agreement to provide um, a fund for walking, cycling and horse riding. And then for residential development, it was £10 a square metre. Um, the, inspectors, the inspector's report, um, which you can obviously read, basically, um, and this was GAM 10 originally, um, the inspector modified the policy saying that um, it was now going to achieve, achieve two objectives. The first of which was to support development of sustainable routes. And then the second one, uh, it says to provide a context for individual discussions to take place with developers to achieve developer contributions, whilst acknowledging the um, restrictions in terms of the SIL regulations. And as you know, SIL regulation 122 provides for three tests that need to be satisfied when lawfully securing a contribution. So um, the inspector recommended um, that the level of funding sought is captured in the supporting text um, and as an indicative figure. And then um, Appendix 3, um, and, he, and he went on to say that Appendix 3, um, which is where those rates are now contained rather than the body of policy itself, he said provides a degree of assurance that any funding sought has been carefully considered. In amending the policy, which now is GAM 8, um, it's slightly more opaque than what the parish council and I and you guys as planning decision takers would probably like. So what it now says is, as appropriate to their scale and nature, new residential and business units should mitigate their impact in the local road network, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, as I said, Appendix 3 is where those rates that were previously in the policy are now con con contained. Um, I think it's true to say that there is some degree of concern by officers as to how that now gets applied because the certainty that was there in the vision of the parish council is diluted somewhat. Um, uh, even Kelly is quite firmly of the view that it still applies in the way that the parish council wanted to apply. Now, um, it may end up getting tested at appeal, but in terms of South Cam's issuing planning decisions, um, Stephen Kelly is firmly of the view that a Section 106 agreement um, is required to secure those rates um, prior to planning permission being granted. Um, so that's a very kind of very quite quick kind of overview. In terms of the actual mechanism, the policy or the supporting text certainly envisaged a unilateral undertaking being submitted by the applicants to the council so as not to delay the planning process where the council needs to be a party to a bilateral um, uh, section 106 agreement and then <clears throat> if that is the case if we had a unilateral undertaking which we did we've drafted a unilateral undertaking which will eventually become i mean it's very easy for a developer literally to fill in kind of eight or nine kind of fields you know application description application number owner site address etc <clears throat> but the interesting Bits about picking up that last exchange with a unilateral undertaking, there is no there is no opportunity 
for the person giving that undertaking to require the council to return the money if it's not used. So, person you talked about five years, we often use 10 years repayments in a unilateral undertaking. There's no obligation on the district council actually to return that money ever. So it's um, it speeds up the planning process, but that's the trade off with the developer. They can't ask for that money back. So it's almost kind of protected in that sense. Um, that's probably enough for me for the minute. <laughs> I'll just ask a quick question about that because I think for residential for new dwellings, it's ten pound per square meter. Yeah. yeah. I measured one and it was like slightly. So I haven't because it didn't say all part thereof. I've just done it, rounded it down. So hopefully that's correct. I think Mary's got our first one. <laughs> right. well, all it means is it's £10 less that we're yeah. for, so it's not like a huge amount, like, you know, with the planning fee, it's always all part thereof. Yeah. So it didn't specifically say that, so I've just rounded it down. I'm sure that's fine. I think this is probably something where we're going to have to learn a bit over the course of the next few months and and possibly years as well because i think this kirsten and i had an exchange of um emails earlier this week where the reality of the policy i think is now starting to hit in terms of exactly how it applies so for example the wording of the policy is new residential and employment and so an extension to an existing premise the policy could be interpreted and in my view should be interpreted that that wouldn't be liable because it's not new but then it's a new floor space so it's whether the new relates to the premise or the business so i think there's i think there's quite a few and luckily i'm not a planning officer so i don't need to <laughs> they could be but i think there are some that there there is going to be a lot of conversation kind of within the team to ensure that we're being consistent and help hence the the kind of need of benefit for regular kind of meetings with colleagues because yeah i think what the parish council envisaged um has been muddied a little bit by what the inspector then actually said and i do i do think at some point possibly in a year or so there will be an inspector's decision that will either undermine the policy or give it strength which is currently kind of a bit lacking um yeah, but yeah, I'm sh I'm sure Kirsten won't mind you asking for ten pounds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so could say is my 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 email is all always there. Please ask or pick up the phone and speak to me if you've got any concerns or issues or anything you want to clarify. Um, obviously, we're learning as well as you, but um, that you know you understand the principles and the reasons why those those policies now exist and what our intention was for them. And I think that's the main thing, that you understand the rationale behind why, what we were trying to achieve. So, um, yes, it's still all a learning process. And um, yeah, like I say, please always get in contact. Could I just make one final point as well, unrelated? It's something that um, Phil was talking about in terms of the football pitch. Um, in South Cams, there um, in the last few years, there have been two appeals allowed for um, five-year housing land supply sites, one for 30 houses in Swavesey and one for 49 houses in Orwell, both of which secured um, uh, blue land for recreation ground purposes. Um, in Swavesey, we've got 2.4 hectares, which is absolutely massive in terms of a land take, where the inspectors in both cases still found notwithstanding the small scale of the developments, they were still necessary, directly related and fairly and reasonably related in scale and kind. So what I'm saying is, you know, a 30 house development extension in the west of Gambling Gate could still conceivably, reasonably be required to provide a football pitch which would far exceed the land take that policy would strictly kind of require. Can I ask a question on the back of what you said about the business? Um, what what is what what is the parish's intention? Is it new businesses or is it extension to existing businesses? Or do you not know? Exactly I think what? I think if you're um, thinking about a large extension, which would require um, numbers of um, employees visiting that site that previously didn't visit that site, or 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 visitors visiting that site, um, and you're you're requiring 
additional services to support it. I think, uh, you know, a large extension, our intention was that that would apply. OK, um, but obviously, like I say, it would be a trial and error and it, situation same with residential extension as well. Then. Um, well, again, you're talking about additional bedroom spaces, additional car parking requirements, additional requirements on the services of Gamling Gay, doctors, play spaces, shops, facilities. It's additional load on the, on the on the on the parish. So uh, the whole purpose of the policy originally was if there was an additional load to the parish, we need to provide those footpaths and cycleways to make sure that people don't get in their cars, they walk to them. And that was the whole principle. Are we applying it to every household or application? That's what was intended. Sorry, I, I, I've got to pick up on this. And I agree with what James has said, that I, I don't see this bit applying to extensions. It, it, it's for me, it's for new dwellings and new units that are created. I, I hear what you're saying, Kirsten, but I, I, no, but I don't think that's what the inspectors I, going to do, just to, to, to define it more for your purposes, I think. Yeah, I think I think James is right. The, what the inspector's done has actually made this policy very opaque in, in the amendments that he's made, um, at least with what you had before was clear, albeit he's, he specifically says it's a de facto seal, which is not acceptable. And that's why he's taken that out. So, uh, although we now seem to be applying it like a de facto seal. So I, I expect this to get challenged at some point um, in, in the way that um, we are in, uh, intending to apply it to start with. Um, but yes, I, I, I'm not convinced that it's the way the inspector deemed it um, to be applied. And, I, and I, my view is it certainly shouldn't be applied to extensions, particularly householder extensions. I mean, there's nothing there's nothing preventing. I mean, what this policy doesn't do is override local plan policies T, I, eight and two, which are which cover developer contributions to mitigate the impact of development for transport and, and everything else. So it, so even if there if there was a large extension or if there was an extension to an existing premises, which was demonstrably um, uh, uh, it was identified that it would cause a demonstrable impact on the local road network. Then, in, then don't rely on this policy. Have a conversation with Cambridgeshire County Council and say, do we need money for roads and footpaths and things like that? And you know, my experience with Tam Parry is he'll ask for anything that he can get his hands on. <laughs> uh, so don't. So in those instances, kind of use the policies that you think are going to carry the most weight in the circumstances. So. Yeah. And yeah, sorry, just to be clear on that as well, I think if there's an extension to an existing premises which is creating new units, then you could argue there's an argument there that they're not just saying it's an extension to an existing business. If it's an extension to an existing building, but is going to create new space for, for, for new tenants or whatever, then yeah, that, that's certainly, I think, open for discussion. Um, but I see it being not relevant to an existing business that just wants to have a bit more floor space to expand its business um, that's already operating. I, I don't see that necessarily being relevant. I'm aware we're over time, so <laughs> anything, anything else? <laughs> Only one question. <clears throat> we obviously are very aware of especially Little Heath and the growth that's happened in some of the hamlets. Um, is that, do you want growth in those areas? <clears throat> They're outside the framework, aren't they, at the moment? No, we it just seems that the, 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 the water has burst forth and there doesn't seem to be anything to stop it. Right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're constrained a bit by that because a lot of that we think happened with wasn't that land yes, yes, so yes. we as a team a lot of us didn't deal with camping gay before no. so we're thinking oh what's what's happened mm -hmm. and our hands are tied yes yeah, so we feel like our hands are tied as, as things have grown even more and, and the yeah, have made sense versions and yeah, so yeah and there's well. lot, been yeah. a lots of appeals mm. that you've had to, to deal with mm. really that's the only that's the only satellite Hamlet that seems to be. Thank you. 
yeah, so much. The other yeah. ones, are, yeah. yeah. And I'm the, just concerned that it will change to so, so, such an extent that it's merging effectively, it potentially might merge with Gamma Gay effectively. Yeah, so as long as we uh, try to retain those fields. I mean, I don't think we would pick, I don't think, now we've got the, the housing figures, haven't we? We've got a good we won't be. Yeah, there should yeah. be pressure from a housing, yeah, yeah housing demands perspective, and at least in the. Yeah, and we'd there. still want to try and respect the character of the original. Yeah, and Little Heath originally was there because it, it was um, a brick, brick fields and uh, brick workers' cottages supporting that industry right at the end of Little Heath. So there were occasional, you know, small workers' cottages and one or two slightly larger properties. Um, and that's that's why it's there effectively. Well, leave it there and thank you everyone and I'll let you carry on with your team meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> 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 <laughs>